So, uh, yesterday morning, uh, before I left to head to the airport to head to Chicago, I was having a conversation with a couple of my colleagues in the mental health profession, and uh, we were talking about the uh, 10 most stressful careers in the United States, and of course, uh, police officer was one of those. It wasn't at the top, uh, but it was one of those. And one of the questions they asked me was, Harold, if you had to do it all over again, you had the opportunity or the choice to become a police officer all over again, would you do it? And without hesitation, I said, yes, absolutely. This is by far one of the best careers that there is out there. It's the noblest profession that there is out there. I had a great 20-year career with the Michigan State Police. I had opportunities to work all over the, the state, all over southern uh, lower Michigan, uh, work in communities from rural towns uh, to farming uh, communities to the city of Detroit and metropolitan Detroit. And also made a lot of friends, uh, established and maintained a lot of great relationships, not only with people that I work with, not only with officers from other uh, police departments, but also with people from the community. And those have been great, long-lasting relationships. And those relationships have allowed me to uh, learn about different cultures, uh, develop friendships, and uh, learn to respect differences uh, that, that we had between us. So I want to talk about that. Um, there's no secret that the relationship between police and community throughout our country is, is strained, to say the least, right now. Um, we see it all over, everywhere we go, in the media, whether it be uh, news media, social media. Um, we hear it from every corner uh, in our communities, uh, whether it be uh, community meetings, community forums going on, that sort of thing. And also, um, you officers who are still actively doing the job of a police officer. You hear about it. You see it in the communities, the people that you interact with. Now, there are lots of stories of great relationships between police and community. You all have witnessed those. You all create those stories. But we don't hear about those. We hear about the negative ones, all the negative interactions between police and community. And some of those stories are warranted because of the ne negative interactions that police have had with members of different communities. But we have to fix this. It's critically important that we fix it. In fact, we have an obligation to fix it. A moral obligation, a civic duty to fix it. We have to fix it through acknowledging our differences, whether there be cultural differences, personal differences, political differences, you name it. We have to learn what those differences are, and then we have to respect those differences. That's how we can fix it. I want to talk about three terms or three words. Uh, the first word is culture. Now, typically when we hear the word culture, we automatically think about skin color. We think about race, ethnicity, religious preference. But the actual definition of the word culture is a set of values and traditions that affect an individual's or particular group or organizations the way they perceive, think, or behave. Okay, let me say that again. The values, norms, and traditions that affect how individuals of a particular group or organization perceive, think, or behave. Now, when we think of the word culture in that context, it really broadens the number of things that come to mind when we hear that word, culture. So keep that in mind as I talk right here. And as much as we are the same as human beings, which has already been stated earlier, it is undeniable that we have differences in all, in all those areas. The next word is cultural competence. And cultural competence is simply one's ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures. And the third word is respect. The simple definition of the word respect is an act of giving particular attention or consideration to someone or a topic or a subject. So 
As Brian stated already, I was born and raised in the city of Detroit. Um, I have eight brothers and sisters, all same mom and dad. We grew up in the same home. We all went to public schools, uh, grew up and lived in uh, middle class neighborhoods. My dad was a bus driver for the city of Detroit for 30 years. My mother did commercial maintenance work. And I was a good kid. I mean, I became a police officer, so I had to have been a good kid, right? Most of the kids I ran around with, most of my friends were good kids. We did normal things that kids do in the neighborhood. We, we played ball. We um, got in trouble by running on the neighbor's grass. We climbed on top of garages and things like that, things that normal kids do. But we were good kids, and we didn't get in trouble. My kids had good parents. I had good parents. Now, of course, in the community that I lived in, there were some kids who were not so good, kids who stole things. Kids who got involved in gang activity and drug activity. Kids who got in trouble with the law on a regular basis. And they were usually the reason that police came into the community because they were called and they came in and they dealt with those kids. And some of those interactions were not very good. One, because of what the kids were doing. And then also because of the way the police handled that. The unfortunate part about that is that me, my friends, and a lot of the other members of our community, probably 80 or 90 percent of them, also had to be subjected to the negative interactions that came with those police officers coming in. Because the perception that those police officers had of the culture within my neighborhood, within my community, was negative. It was based on the interactions they that they had with those individuals who caused trouble. So we all had to be subjected to those negative interactions. In fact, just one example I'll give you is, so we didn't have a basketball hoop in my neighborhood. None of us had a basketball hoop. We would play basketball against the pole. We'd pick a spot on the pole, and, you know, if you shoot and hit close enough to it to where you can say you hit it, then you got two points, all right? But my brother's, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my friend's sister, she put up a basketball hoop at her house, which was about six miles away from our house. Now, we had a big family, so my dad had a 1976 Ford LTD station wagon. Same car that I took to my homecoming dance, but I put my brother's Cadillac spoke wheels on it before I drove it there. <laughs> um, but we were driving, and, you know, there's six of us in the car, and we got pulled over by the police. And it didn't matter whether the police were white or black. It was police and us. And most of the time, it was young African-American police officers that we dealt with. But in any event, they pulled us over. I was driving, of course, and uh, they took us out of the car. They searched us. They searched our clothes. They searched our, our shoes. They searched the car. And once they found out that there was nothing wrong with any of us, everything was okay, they gave us our license back and said, why do you guys always have to ride in groups in cars? Why do you always have to load up a car? I said, well, because we're going to play basketball, and this is my dad's car, and that's what we do. That's just one example, and that's one of the lighter examples, but those are the kind of things that we were subjected to as good kids in the neighborhood because of the perception that the police had of the culture um, in the community that I lived in, a wrong perception. And then you take the flip side of that, my perception of law enforcement was negative as well. My perception was driven by the limited access I had to police in my neighborhood because the ones who came into my neighborhood treated us all badly. They talked to us like we were dogs sometimes. And I watched what they did to some of their older boys in the, in the neighborhood. But as I began to get older and start driving around the city a little more, driving outside of the city, I started having more positive interactions with police officers. Okay, so thinking back on that, that term cultural competency, my knowledge and understanding of the police culture was so narrow, but now it's starting to expand. My competence level regarding the police culture is starting to expand now. Um, in fact, it expanded so much, and as Brian talked about, uh, one day in a, in a car dealership I was working in, I had a conversation with a state trooper who, who had came into the, uh, the dealership, and I decided that's what I'm going to do. And I vowed right then and there that I would never, ever treat a person the way I was treated when I grew up in, in my neighborhood and in my community. So, as I became a police officer, now my understanding and knowledge of the culture expanded even more. My competence raised to, a, to a, a, you know, a, a much higher degree. And I learned that 
many of the men and women, in fact, most of the men and women in law enforcement that I work with, we all got into it for the same reason. We wanted to help others. We wanted to make a difference. And, you know, a lot of people think that that's just a cliche when we say it. But you ask any police officer, you know, ask any one of you in the room why you got into law enforcement is to help others. It's to make a positive difference in the lives of people who are in the, in the community. It's to get bad people off the street, arrest criminals. I also learned that the, the law enforcement uh, profession is stressful at times, can be very stressful. When you look at the things that we do, we see day in and day out, the cumulative effect of those things have an enormous impact on us and our lives. I also learned that policing is a lifestyle. It's not a job that we come to and, and punch in and punch out every single day. There are things that we see and do that we take home with us every day, whether we want to or not. I learned that policing is sometimes a thankless profession. We have to drum up and muster up our own self-gratification for the things that we do because we know we're making a difference, but we don't always hear thank you. So it can seem thankless at times. And then I learned that it is nearly impossible to help someone who is not a member of the law enforcement community to understand what it's like to be a police officer. You have to do the job. You have to be a part of the culture in order to understand what it's like. Now, when we hear things in the media... And we hear all these negative accounts of what law enforcement is, what police are. They're racist, they're mean, they're unfair, they're dishonest, all those things. It really bugs us because we know what we're about. That whole list of things that I just read, as far as the reasons we get into law enforcement, is what we want people to know about us. Yet their level of competence when it comes to law enforcement culture is limited to what they, their experiences were. All right? So just as we want people to know all the, quali the good qualities about our law enforcement culture, when we think of what our perceptions are about the communities that we serve, when you look at the cultures that exist within the communities that we serve, and it may not just be one culture, because, you know, we're a culture in this room right here, all right? There are certain uh, traditions and values and norms that we have as, as, a, as a group. But within a community, you may have a low-income trailer park culture. You may have a neighborhood that's a little more affluent. Affluent. There's a culture there. All right? So what do those members of those different communities and those cultures want us to know about them? Just as, as much as we want them to know about us, they want us to know the good things about them, about their neighborhoods, about their communities, and about their culture. So how do we overcome cultural competence? We do it one interaction at a time. I've gone to many classes on cultural diversity where we put up lists and we identify all the things that we think and know about different cultures. And that doesn't teach us, that doesn't, does not expand our cultural competence. What expands that cultural competence is actually interacting with people and members of different communities, different cultures. Learning the norms, learning the thoughts, learning the perceptions, learning the behaviors and things like that. And then as we learn them, we develop relationships and develop, develop mutual trust for one another. And when we do that, we develop that trust. Then we can develop relationships where we can have more effective means of policing or serving a community. When we develop trust, we develop relationships, and we can become more effective in the things that we do. I was a post commander at the Adrian Post, which is uh, in Lenaway County in Michigan, another farming community. Culture shock for me because I grew up in the city. Um, and there was a call of an elderly man who was racking off rounds in his shotgun because the Department of Environmental Quality, the government, was spraying chemicals around his farm. That's what he thought. The sergeant on the desk was about ready to call the SWAT team out because we've got a barricaded gun. This old man is shooting out of his house, and his house is way off the back of the road. Has anybody talked to him is what I asked the sergeant. He says, no. I said, well, get him on the phone. Let me talk with him. Sir, this is Lieutenant Love, State Police. Tell me what's going on. These SOBs, they're, they're spraying stuff on my farm, and, you know, they're going to ruin my crops, and I'm not going to have it. Well, can I come and talk to you? 
Yeah, you can come and talk to me. I said, great. Come out your house. Come out into the front yard. I'm going to pull up in your driveway. I'm just going to be me. I'm going to come and talk with you. We pull up. I get out of the car. We walk around the back of his house, and we start talking. Well, this farm has been in his family for generations. This is his livelihood. This means everything to him. And the fact that somebody's going to come out and carelessly throw, uh, spray chemicals around his home just set him off. Well, the fact was that they were just out doing surveying. I don't know where he got that they were going to spray chemicals, but that was not the case. After about 30 or 40 minutes, we're sitting in his back room. I'm learning the names of his grandchildren, the pictures on the wall. We're drinking coffee. But again, I had to take the time to interact with this man, to understand this farming culture. You know, why this was such a thing for him that he would actually shoot his shotgun because the DEQ was around his house and he thought they were going to spray. Once I did that, again, it enabled me to have a better understanding of the culture in general, and I was able to educate my troops on how we needed to respond and interact with people. So again, just one example. There's many examples, and many of you in this room are probably experts at that, of building relationships, of understanding um, the different cultural, uh, cultural aspects of the communities that we're serving. It's important that we spread that and that we help educate our fellow officers on the importance of developing those relationships and developing trust. So what's in it for me as a police officer? Why is this important now? For one, as a police officer, it allows me to be more effective in serving the community that I'm working in. It also improves police and community trust. And when we improve trust, we can get things done faster, more efficiently, more effectively. We can work with members of the community to serve the community. It also increases personal and job fulfillment. There's nothing worse than going to work every day feeling like you're going into an adversarial environment, if you think about that. There's been times in my career where that was the case. I felt that way, and I'm sure that some of you had the same thing. But there's nothing worse than that. If we can increase our cultural competence and develop relationships and develop trust among the members of the community that we're serving, then we can improve that environment and have greater job fulfillment and personal fulfillment. And I think we owe it to the future generation of police officers and the communities that they're serving. I don't know how many chiefs I talk to, I do pre-employment psychological evaluations, and they talk about how difficult it is to fill their employment list, their employment roster. Years ago, you've got hundreds of people applying for maybe five positions. Today, it's hard to get that hundred people to apply for 20 positions, is what I'm hearing from the chiefs. Because you talk to people and say, I would not want to be a cop today, because, man, it's just horrible for cops. No. This is a great profession. The ship that we call Police and Community Trust has just gotten way off course, and we have to work hard to bring it back together, and we can do that one interaction at a time. The actions of every police officer in an instant can impact an individual for life and even communities for generations. That was a quote by the late Dr. Stephen R. Covey. So what are we going to do about it? What is going to be your interaction with the community, members of the community? How are you going to increase your cultural competency? We owe it to the communities. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the profession. So let's go do it. Thank you.